We are welcoming now Christopher Beige, who is Professor Emeritus in Religious Studies. And uh, he is on and all the technical stuff is working, so you can be you can put your shoulders down and breathe easily. Amazing. Everything's fine now. And uh, Chris is also an author and a psychedelic explorer. And in his book, LSD and the Mind of the Universe, Diamonds from Heaven, Chris meticulously, 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 thank you, Rasmus, documents his insights from 73 high-dose LSD sessions conducted over the course of 20 years and following the protocols established by Stan Groff. Chris has written several other spectacular books, and since they first met, there has been a very special understanding and close connection between, between Jacob and Chris. And it is an extraordinary honor to have Chris with us today from the United States. Give a sincerely warm welcome to Christopher Beige. Hi, Chris. Hello, Jacob. It's good to be with you today. Wow, good you are here and the technique is working. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had some issues before. So good to see you, Chris. I was, I met you in in um, in the Prague conference yeah. in 2017, and and I was just blown away by your lecture. And what what meant a great deal to me was, you know, I've been writing a book about a long systematic journey yeah. and suddenly it was another one <laughs> who have done the same over the same period of 20 years totally systematic and this just blew my mind and it just felt immediately a close relationship to you so it, it means a lot to me that you are participating here in our tribute to Stan who was the inspiration source for both you and me and a lot of other people yeah yeah, that was a wonderful conference. It was it was the opportunity to present the uh, the ideas contained in LSD in the mind of the universe before it actually was published. And yes. of course, that was the ITA conference in Prague, where Stan brought the ITA back to his hometown, which was a wonderful place to release, in a sense, the content of LSD in the Mind of the Universe. Absolutely. And it's also a pleasure to be here in the program with Susan and Jorge, uh, and I deeply affirm both of their uh, insights that they shared today. I think we all agree that that, the, that that Stan really showed the way and opened the door, and that he really had, has been showing the way for all of us. Mm -hmm. He certainly did open the door for me. So, so can 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 you tell how how he opened the door for you and tell how how you your journey started? Well, why don't we do this? If we're going to be talking about LSD in the mind of the universe, and some of your audience know it and some of it doesn't, mm -hmm. let me do a little short presentation, just a quick overview yes. to, to introduce the book, and then we'll go into a more open discussion. Do that. And I'm, Let's find I'm this. hoping this will work. I'm going to share my screen and see if this... Okay. Is this coming through correctly? I, yes, it looks, all right. Is this uh, coming through? It's a picture of the cover of the book. Mm, I can't see the screen right now. Okay, hold on, choose what you want. Oh, I see the entire screen, all right. Hold on, share. Okay. Yes, hold now on. we can see your screen. Now you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. And I'm trying to get this up running. Okay. Yes. Here we go. Now you're seeing this? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, this is the book that I'm we're talking about today. And of course, all of my work comes from Stan's work. And I was just out of graduate school and just beginning my academic career in 1978 when I first read his book, Realms of the Human Unconscious, quickly followed by LSD psychotherapy. And this was a turning point in my young academic life. And I want to emphasize that I was trained as a philosopher of religion, 
not uh, a psychologist. But as a philosopher of religion, I immediately recognized the significance of Stan's early work uh, for my discipline, for answering or addressing questions that philosophers want to address, the meaning of life, whether there is continuation of life after death, whether there is an intelligent universe, intelligence running in the universe. And of course, in Stan's many books that followed, he just set the course for so many uh, deep explorations of these topics. So, so what happened was, and, and as you know from Stan's work, from especially from early on, he differentiates between low-dose psycholytic therapy and high-dose psychedelic therapy. Psychedelic therapy was designed to trigger, try to trigger a near-death type experience for people who were terminally ill. So it wasn't therapeutically focused so much as trying to give them a glimpse into where they were going to be going when they died. And so as a philosopher, I was more interested in cosmological exploration than I was therapeutic healing. And so what I ended up doing over 20 years, from 79 to 99, I did 73 high-dose LSD sessions. I worked at 500 to 600 micrograms every session, totally internalized, using the protocol established in LSD psychotherapy. And I always used the same protocol, the same set and setting, same sitter, same substance, same dose level, recording process, even the same location, because all of these can affect one's uh, experience. Now, at the time, I thought I was just doing an extended series of high dose of, of psychedelic therapy. But when I got to the end of my journey and was looking back, I realized that this journey had gone so deep and had gone on so long that it really, I was encountering phenomena very different from what was originally addressed in psychedelic therapy. So I believed the protocol needed a new name. And so I, I call it psychedelic exploration. The method is psychedelic therapy. But the repetition of many, many sessions, I think, puts it into a different category of psychedelic exploration. So again, very quickly, we use psychedelics for many different things, recreation, relaxation, uh, enhanced creativity. But the three kind of the most common uses that we're focused on today are for therapeutic healing, for spiritual awakening, as we see in this book, uh, Zig Zag Zen, a discussion of Buddhist and psychedelic practitioners. And this is where I started. I kind of started my psychedelic work seeking spiritual awakening. But over the time, I began to realize that a different trajectory emerged, and that trajectory is cosmological exploration, to actually explore the deep structure of the cosmos through these sessions. So that's the basic protocol, the methodology of the book. Now, LSD is often likened to the nuclear bomb uh, because it, both of them have some devastating power, destructive and creative power. And LSD and the nuclear bomb were invented in the same decade. Uh, I'd like you to imagine this nuclear explosion, which we're going to see is a sustained psychedelic series, not just one session, but one session after another, about five a year for many years, so that these, this is an ongoing developmental process. And my experience was that when you do psychedelics in this way, you go deeper and deeper into the universe, and you begin to engage levels of reality that were previously invisible to you. But eventually, in a sustained practice, one, one dives deeper and deeper and deeper into the universe. And between every level of reality, when one is becoming operationally competent at that level of reality, in order to go into a deeper level of reality, you go into a, a, another round of death and rebirth. That There's not just ego death. Ego death is the first death as you're leaving space-time reality but there are other deaths that take place at the collective level of consciousness, the archetypal level of consciousness, so on and so forth. So 
We're not, of course, talking about nuclear bombs. We're talking about the universe, the deep structure of the universe, exploring the universe. When I got to the end of my 73 sessions and was really looking over the whole length, I identified five fundamental transitions or levels of consciousness that I spent these years exploring. The first had to do with personal mind, uh, one's personal consciousness, the personal unconscious, healing the wounds of one's personal life. The second is a very different, having to do with collective consciousness, the collective mind, the species mind, healing the mind and heart of our entire species. The third level was archetypal mind, going into levels of reality that lie behind time and space, behind history, behind the very manifestation of the physical universe. And fourth, causal oneness or the one mind, when the universe ceases to function as a system of complex interrelated parts and is experienced as moving as a single dynamic living organism and all of us as fractal aspects of this organism. And then moving even deeper where I spent the last five years of my work exploring what I call the diamond luminosity, what Buddhism calls Dharmakaya, the clear light of absolute reality. And just very quickly to wrap this up, just to, to show you how this lays out in the book, I simply am telling the story of these different stages of experience. So the first, this chapter, Crossing the Boundary of Birth and Death, is about the perinatal level of consciousness, stands basic perinatal, perinatal matrices, one, two, three, four, culminating in ego death. Um, took two and a half years crossing this domain moving into the collective mind, several chapters, engaging what I call the ocean of suffering, uh, the pain stored in the collective unconscious of all the traumas of history that are still, in a sense, unresolved and still alive within the collective psyche. Deep time in the soul, my first transcending of time and going into the soul, the consciousness that lies beyond the ego, the consciousness, which is the integrator of all of our experiences in all of our lifetimes. And then uh, going deeper, initiation in the universe was kind of like a crash course in cosmology. Again, just very quickly, a chapter of the greater reel of archetypal reality, where I summarize the year and a half that I spent exploring dimensions of reality at this level, the reality behind time and space. Causal oneness is addressed in a chapter called The Benediction of Blessings. The Diamond Luminosity is addressed in a chapter called Diamond Luminosity. And the chapter that I've skipped is called The Birth of the Future Human, where one I describe, I, I draw together all the various experiences that I had over all of these years that addressed one fundamental question. Where is humanity in its evolutionary journey? What is the nature of the crisis that we are entering? And uh, a vision of the birth of the future human emerging in history. I consider in many ways, I consider this chapter the most important chapter of the book because it concerns our children, our grandchildren, all of our children of history through time. And then a last chapter, the final vision, the last great vision given me on the journey. And then a chapter on coming off the mountain, what has been happening since 1999. So that's enough of that. That basically just gives that story. And let me see if I can go away from shared screen. Let's take that off. Is that? Yes. Wow, there? Chris. So we're coming back on. Yes, okay, good. Beautiful. Yeah. Very amazing. I, I, I like to if we can go through the sequence because you started in was it it's seventeen was it ninety seventy nine or where was it you started your first session? Seventy nine. Yeah. yeah. Back in seventy nine. Yeah. And and then you was it five years you did the first sequence of sessions? Yeah. Before you took I a break. I did four years of work. And then I took a break for six years. 
And then I started again and did 10 more years of work. And and after the f the first five years, you wrote your first book, Life Cycles, right? Yeah. yeah. During during the, that six year hiatus, I wrote the, the book on reincarnation, yeah. Life Cycles. Could you yeah. just give that book a, a brief comment? Because that was actually the first book I read from you. Yeah. And it was actually my friend who had told about in the beginning, Jan Lomi, who translated it into Danish. And I think all I did, that book was really mind blowing because you, it was nearly like, 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 like you were in the court, you know, and said that reincarnation, is, that's for real. Yeah, and that's basically, I, I think that I gathered <clears throat> all the evidence that we had accumulated so far, the psychological evidence, psychotherapeutic evidence, even Stevenson's work with young children, Uh, the drawing on classical and contemporary sources and basically tried to establish an empirical basis just to basically say it's time. Reincarnation is true. Yeah. It's a documented phenomena. That was it. But now let's think about what is true about life if we look at it with reincarnation being our assumed uh, reality. And then life cycles is basically continuing to explore the implications of living within a reincarnating universe so it was a it was a core concept to me just because i think if you if you don't understand reincarnation you'll never understand what's going on in life yes. that is the that is the gateway that's the opener to understand that our consciousness is older than our body and you're talking about living in the one time perspective and the many times perspective right yeah yeah And, and yeah. when you're living in the many time perspective, it totally alters your your way and your life strategy on all levels, right? It does. It open, yeah. Once you're open to your deep history, you're also opening to your deep future. You, 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 the vision of the soul emerges in in history, and the soul thinks about life differently than the ego does. The soul has a much larger time horizon, a much more complex relationships with many, many different types of people, many people over many, many centuries. Um, and also, since we've been male, female, white, black, every race, every religion, every culture over many, many thousands of years, then naturally it develops a kind of a, a heart of, of a universal human, the, a, a universal human what I call the one heart that has the capacity to embrace um, a much larger expanse of human experience. And and this is what you can experience during high dosage sessions. And and I have some of those experiences myself where you just see incarnation yeah. after incarnation and just see how, how you're living, you know, like thousands of years and what task you have in this lifetime. Yeah, yes. Yeah, you can get clarity about what's going on in your life, clarity about why you incarnated, clarity about how to maximize your usefulness to others and to yourself in this lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you moved on in, in your next book, which was... Um, uh, Dark Night Early Dawn. Exactly. And there you yeah. come with the concept of the species mind. Yeah. Can, can you Can you tell us about that? Well, in Dark Night, Early Dawn, I basically <clears throat> tried to address and to describe experiences that came from the first half of my psychedelic journey. I, I deliberately kind of did not address the second half of the journey, even though the book was published in 2000 after I'd completed the journey. I really tried to stick to the first half where I was transitioning into layers and layers and layers of collective consciousness and what really drove the question was um, after i went through ego death i was thinking that things would get easier now uh, but what happened was things got worse i began to get drawn in for hours and hours and hours every session into what the buddhists would call the hell realms just terrible terrible suffering terrible pain uh, the anguish of history And eventually, at first I thought, well, this must be a deeper form of ego death. Mm -hmm. But it went on for so long and it involved so many hundreds of thousands of yeah. beings that I began to understand that, no, the purpose here, the, the, the project is not my personal purification or personal healing, but it's our collective 
healing, our collective transformation, <clears throat> which took me a long time to, to accept this because here one individual working in one room in one place in the, in the country is somehow tapping into the collective psyche and in a way facilitating some kind of, mo of modest healing process that is much larger than anything to do with their personal history. And this went on for two years and eventually culminated in a, a kind of death, but it wasn't an ego death. It was a death that was taking place at the level of the species mind, at the level of the collective psyche. And so in Dark Night Early Dawn, I basically was, the theme of that book was our individual work has the potential to impact the collective. And in fact, the name of the game right now is collective transformation. That the challenge of history, the challenge we're facing, that what we're all working on, even as we do our individual work, it's serving, it's in service of a deeper transformation of the death and rebirth of the species mind, which I think is building in history right now. It's building. I, I think this is a very important point you have here because what you're saying is that and what you experience is also what we experience here, that when people are undergoing deep transformation are, and are um, releasing their traumas and, and get the healing, then it's not only for themselves. We are also healing the, the, the collective mind and what you call the species mind. And, yeah. and I remember when, when, when Stan was, was uh, back in Czechoslovakia in 2014 and made a, a group full of tropic breath work session again, I said, I want to see this. I want to participate just to, just to see him again, you know, in, in action. And what was really remarkable for me was that we were in a big hall with, you know, 100 breathers and 100 sitters. And then there was going only five or 10 minutes, you know, loud music. Then people would start screaming. You yeah. Know, after five or ten minutes, and I have that experience. Wow, there is there's so much pain inside the collective field of consciousness, and and yeah. and every little healing is is going to participate in this in this transformation. But there are so much suffering, and this is also what what you're describing in your book. For these years, it's just like when you're reading, it's just like pain and pain and suffering yeah. in 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 many sessions. But but the yeah. fact that that individual can be part of this healing. I think that this is really exciting and, and also very good news what you are saying and describing. Yeah. And then the curious thing was, after <clears throat> two years of this work, I came through this tremendous crescendo and, and explosion and a death rebirth process. And at that point, I was catapulted beyond the species mind, beyond human history, And I never re-entered the domain of the ocean of suffering again. Yes. And I know that the suffering continues in the collective psyche, so that really raises an issue. Why was I allowed to detach from it? Even though the pain and suffering, there's so much more that's still to re... And that, the way I ended Dark Night Early Dawn was with yeah. that question. Uh, and what I've learned subsequently was that we actually can become more useful to the collective transformation process by working from above it rather than working from below it. So in the early stages, we drain the poisons of history out of the collective psyche. But later, if we can establish conscious communion with the deeper metaphysical levels, we can infuse our experience is infusing into the collective species mind from above, so to speak. So it's kind of like draining poisons out from below, pouring grace into it from above. Very, very exciting. Yeah. And then you continued, and can you tell where it continued? Well, I, I then explored archetypal reality for a year and a half uh, and experienced what Plato was talking about and what Carl Jung was talking about, except not exactly because the archetypes that I experienced were not the archetypes that Plato describes, so they were and they weren't. Similarly, the archetypes of Jung describes were 
my experience of archetypes was confirming and yet different from that. So I talk about this in the book. For me, the archetypes are vast, vast, vast living beings, huge beings at the at the deep platonic level but mm -hmm. they're living they're dynamic they're not static they are continuing to evolve and change as we do mm -hmm. and then there is a deep a, a, a lower level of archetype of reality where i was taken inside the human species and experienced our human species over and over and over again as a single organism that we are all cells within a living organism um, and the complex feedback between the individual and the totality and the totality and the individual there was absolutely no separation just a pulsing a fractal um, mutual interconnection between the whole and the part and that all of us in healing our individual minds contributes to healing the mind of the species. And we, even when we heal our individual diseases, that all of us are carrying, it's, it we're cells within a disease that is in burdening the human family. And when we heal our individual body, we contribute to the healing of the human body as a whole. And then after exploring this for a while, I went through another death rebirth process. And it's wasn't like ego death and it wasn't like collective human death it was like being dissolved into the sun it was just involved huge huge explosive dynamic uh, high high energy and i moved into causal reality into a year where i was just given one blessing after another experiencing uh, non-dual consciousness, shunyata, emptiness, uh, the cosmic void, uh, cosmic love. But the signature of this entire year and a half was being drawn into a reality where the world is one. The world moves as one, lives as one. And you can't take your individual consciousness, in a sense, into that reality you dissolve your consciousness totally and you experience the world, so to speak, as God experiences the world. So you don't experience the world from within your, anything like your individual perspective or even the human perspective or even the archetypal perspective, but you experience the world in a sense as the pulsing of the divine in time and space. Yes, yes, yes. And that, that is a of course was a wonderful blessing and i thought okay well this must be it i mean to, to dissolve into oneness this was like how much better can this get and well i found it was going to get even better still because what <laughs> happened was that there was another round of death and rebirth the deeper intensity and i was catapulted into a domain of of light I had known light many times before, but this was a domain of light that was exceptionally clear. I learned that there are many gradations of light and, and, and shades of light and permutations of oneness. And I went into this cosmic light that I came to call the diamond luminosity. And once I touched it, then it completely obliterated any interest I had in exploring the other dimensions of consciousness. Well, the only thing that meant most to me was to get back to this domain of life. And so for the next four years and the next 25 sessions, I entered this domain of light four times and only four times. So that in between those were lots and lots of purification, lots and lots of in intense deaths and rebirth processes, but touching the diamond luminosity four times. And those are the diamonds from heaven that I talk about in the book, in the subtitle of the book, The True the, Diamonds. The Four Diamonds Award. It was a yeah. four experience, yeah. And how alive are these experiences in you now? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> you know, psychedelics are tricky, aren't they? You know, because they open us, but eventually we, we contract back to our resting state. And we open and we contract back to our resting state. And the resting state changes exactly. over time, yes. but it never changes as fast as we might like 
But over time, with expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting, we do begin to be drawn deeper into our own personal future and even into the evolutionary future of humanity. So I wish I could say, I live in a state of perpetual oneness, I live in a state of cosmic bliss all the time, but that's not the case. Uh, but even to touch these experiences temporarily, they begin to soak into you, they begin to infuse your thinking, your feeling, you begin to live consciously in a world where you know that the world of divided reality is real, but the world of undivided reality is also real, and in some ways even more real. So I, you know, I do my practices, I do my spiritual practices, and I, I try to absorb these these things as best I can. So these experiences has influenced your life, your daily life a lot. I can imagine. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I yeah. think one one of the very important experiences for me in my psychedelic journey is that we are living on all levels simultaneously. Yeah. You know, on one level we are our body, and I'm Jakob, I'm playing music, and on another level I'm the soul, and another level it doesn't even matter if I'm soul or not. I'm this oneness, and I think to to yeah. to to live this and, and know this that gives a totally other flavor in your daily life. Yeah. So, Very much so. So can you can you tell um, what what did you do to integrate your experiences? Can you give some advice, you know, for the younger generation when they do their their journeys? How do you integrate? How do you implement these powerful journeys in into your daily life? Yeah. What did you do? Uh, <clears throat> first, that's a really important question, and we're paying more attention to this in the psychedelic literature. There's a book coming out uh, this coming year, and on uh, it'll be out in a few months on specifically uh, psychedelics and integration. Mm -hmm. um, really important question. Uh, the first thing that leads towards good integration is having a clean session. So uh, that means. Uh, the cleaner and more isolated and selective the environment in which you do your session, the cleaner your contact during your session, the easier it is going to be to integrate it. So if you stay in contact with the world and you're in a concert kind of environment that has one kind of trajectory. But if you are in isolated space, you're separated from the world, you're doing all the things you do in an LSD, therapeutically focused session, you have a clean environment you know that whatever you're dealing with is coming entirely from within. So the first step of integration is how well you organize the session day itself. Um, the careful setting, careful uh, attention to intention. Second step is to record your experiences as, adequate, as accurately as possible, to bring, bring it down into writing or into art or into music, but to basically bring it down, consolidate it, because our memories fade. Mm -hmm. and, and it's important to get a written account or some artistic account within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, I spent years and years thinking about my sessions and studying them. I mean, I didn't write LSD in the Mind of the Universe until 20 years after I finished my sessions. So I did 20 years of work in the sessions and 20 years of processing them afterwards. So thinking about them, pondering them, trying to live by their, um, by their teachings. One of the strategies I think for important parts is to get your session recorded as quickly as possible within 24 hours to make an accurate and complete account of the session. And then it's a matter, I think, of, of doing spiritual practices. You can accelerate the integration of your psychedelic experiences by reaching out and integrating those experiences into your, into your spiritual practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can reinforce the connections that you experience during your session stay uh, in the day-to-day -day practice, in your day-to-day -day spiritual practice. And I really, this is really important. I think the deeper you want to go, 
the more important it is to have a daily spiritual practice uh, in order to keep yourself grounded and hold it. Um, for me, writing uh, LSD in the mind of the book and the universe was uh, an act of integration. It was to try to put down in black and white as clearly and articulately as I could what these what happened on these days, because I I think these weren't private experiences. Yes. On the one hand, they were private experiences. They were just my experiences. But on the other hand, the dimensions of consciousness that I was being dissolved in were not private. They're, they're universal dimensions of consciousness. And therefore, there is a sense in which when you are integrating universal experiences into your individual life, it, it's a delicate balance between universe, integrating the universal into the finite and integrating the finite into the universal. This kind of back and forth. And all spiritual practitioners know this. All think, spiritual practices, different mystical traditions are working that particular edge. And, it, yeah. and it's also important to, to bring forth your experiences to other people so they can learn from it. Uh, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I just like to give you some some of our um, experiences from here because you know we have created this <laughs> modern elosis over a, mm -hmm. a long period of time and we have conducted ceremonies for, for the last six years and we've specialized in in making music f through the ceremonies you know really travel music alive and yeah. what we say here is that that when people are traveling it is like three phases there the preparation be aware of your inner in a in a state in your dreams and write down and then there's a journey and then the integration phase and what we give here is that that during the ceremony we we play for six hours inspired by, mm -hmm. by by the field and then after the journey they have the music so yet so they can write down the experiences f f f to the music mm -hmm. and 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 what we have experienced is that um even the people are getting less and less <laughs> Of the medicine, then they get stronger and stronger experiences. It is like yeah. that the collective feel in the temple or in the travel hall is just like building up, and you're writing something about the same experiences in in in, in your the way you were teaching. Could you could you say yeah. a little about that? Because I think this is really an, an interesting yeah. point of both the species minds, but also making these collective yeah. field a morphogenetic field of energies. Yeah. All of us have had the experience that when we go into deep non-ordinary states, we go into expanded states and we go into collective states. And, and so we're we're working at a very deep level that goes into the species and then underneath the species into the cosmic level. Uh, and so I, my experience as a teacher, I never talked about my personal psychedelic experiences in the classroom. I mean, because it just it was an illegal practice I was doing and I couldn't bring it into the classroom. I taught Stan Groff's work, psychedelic work in my classes, but I never let my students know that I was doing this work. But what I found was that my students began to be activated by my psychedelic sessions so that <laughs> just by my doing what I did and then coming back and beginning to teach, uh, students were being activated by some type of energetic resonance between their energy and my energy. And it it was just a spontaneous, it wasn't because I was trying to make it happen. In fact, in many ways I was trying to avoid it because it got made complicated. But it's a spontaneous resonance that it's an energetic resonance that transmits automatically around you. So that I found that there, when I would have breakthrough experiences, many of my students would start to have breakthrough experiences wow. in their own life. Really and eventually I, I had I, I got to understand this. I have to really you know come to terms with this. Did I need to protect my students from what was happening or? How does this work? And eventually, after years of, of working with this material and working with my students, I wrote a book called um, The Living Classroom. And in that book, I don't mention psychedelics, but the backstory of The Living Classroom was that it was my attempt to understand how group feels work, how group consciousness works, 
and how an individual's work touches other people. And there's this feedback process where the feels intensifies. So each one of us is physically, in a sense, confined, but our consciousness is not confined. Our consciousness is a, is a field that is not just a private field. It opens up into a social field, into a collective species field, into a cosmic field. And when you work consistently with deep spiritual practices or meditative practices or psychedelic practices, you activate this field and you trigger purification in the field and you trigger breakthrough insights into the field. So basically what I did was to write this book, The Living Classroom, to tell the story of this rhythmic pulse between my inner work even though I don't talk about psychedelics and the inner work that was emerging spontaneously in the lives of my students. And until eventually this became, uh, I think other many other teachers have had similar experiences as I've gone into discussions with people and we're beginning to appreciate that no one makes this journey alone. Mm -hmm. Even though you may be working privately, you are always connected to universal fields and species fields. No one makes this journey alone. That's why the species shows up in our work and our work spills over into the species itself. And I'm sure you've experienced this when you're performing. There's an energy that's generated by the musicians, which activates energy in your audience, which comes back into you as the musicians. And you have that, that tremendous feedback field that intensifies exactly yeah. exactly and and i i remember stan was talking once about when when he, he was saying that when if in in his viewpoint if enough people have these powerful breakthrough ex experience then we work like like i think he was talking about fresh water when you're putting salt in it then it keeps being fresh water for a long time until a certain state that suddenly the water the salt water Yeah, like like the like Sildrys the morphogenetic field with the apes, and when the, when the apes were learning something on the island, suddenly the other were learning it on the other islands. So yes. could, could this could this be a kind of hope for the for the future if enough people are having these breakthrough experiences and, and are healing the species mind, healing the, the the collective consciousness, and then suddenly all other people could have these breakthrough experiences spontaneously? What do you think about that? I think so. I mean, I think there's a, we're entering a very, very intense time in history. Yeah. And uh, when we it's given, particularly given the intensity, given the pressure that the human family is under now, given the, the threat of ecological suicide uh, that we are dealing with, given the tremendous pressure, particularly ever since nuclear weapons entered the arena, which have the potential to extinguish life on the planet. Mm. Uh, the, the entire dynamics of our game have changed so that when we go into deep, deep healing, we naturally kind of open up and if we are receptive to it, we draw in the pain of the species. We draw in the pain of history into our work and, and we move it forward and process it out. Um, I think that we are entering a very, very intense time in history where these dynamics are becoming more pronounced, uh, more excited. It's, and I think we're entering a potential extinction point in history where there's more and more on the line. I mean, this is what I talk about in the chapter on the birth of the future human. Mm. That we are coming to a point where we either give birth to the next stage of human evolution, or we, or we die in the attempt on this planet. Uh, and I, yeah, and I think that's what we're all involved in right now is basically birthing uh, the next iteration of human evolution. And my understanding of what's emerging is the soul. The soul is emerging in history. We're not growing a new arm or, or we're changing our genetics. We literally are reaching a point where Our entire history of all of our reincarnating lives are coming together and what has previously been unconscious is becoming conscious and all of those lives are coming into a point of fusion 
and are, are coming together inside our awareness so that when we wake up to our soul, when we wake up to that deep history, we literally begin to live not as a hundred year old being mm -hmm. with a hundred year life expectancy, but a hundred thousand yes. year being with a hundred thousand life expectancy. I'm very curious, mm -hmm. how, how do you think this process is, you we're talking about the archetypes before and they were living, how do you think that the archetypes are working in this time and what do you think about this progression that Rikatana is talking about in, 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 in Cosmos and Psyche with these diachronic patterns? Could, could you? Could you say something about that? I'm yeah. Curious. Yeah. Well, Rick is a good friend and a colleague, mm -hmm. and uh, Rick has shown us this magic of the pulse, the intelligent pulse of the uh, movement of the planets mm -hmm. and the rhythm of our solar system and the way our lives dance in rhythm with that so in that solar system dance, so that the its breakthroughs, its critical points of tension interact with our lives and carry us through these breakthroughs that this happens not only for us individually but it happens for us collectively there's an archetypal pulse a solar system pulse to the evolution of the human species uh, and it seems that we we really are when we look back at history we can recognize the astrological markers of breakthrough and when we look at our present and in our future we are seeing the astrological markers of breakthrough and we see tension building uh, I, I think we're coming into a very very intense period of history where it's either grow or die and and, yeah. and, and what is your vision for the future <laughs> do you think we're gonna make it <laughs> well and, I can only reflect what's been given to me in my sessions. Yeah. I have no personal view, but mm -hmm. what has been given to me into my sessions mm -hmm. is that we do make it, that yes. I, I've been taken deep enough into the future, into future time, into the crisis that we're coming into, into the death and rebirth of the human family as we enter into this severe uh, ecological crisis period that we're coming into but we do make it. And that when we come out of this eco-crisis period, we will have been changed. We will have been profoundly changed. I think our heart will be broken open. Our minds will be broken open. The soul will be more, uh, we will naturally feel our age. We will naturally feel the, our connections with other human beings who we may not have dealt with much in this lifetime, but we have dealt with in other lifetimes, therefore we have a felt sense of community with them. I think we I think we will make it. I think it, like all births, it's a dangerous time. Uh, not all births are successful. It, there's no guarantee, but at least the visions which have been given to me indicate that humanity does make it that we are going through an intentional, meaningful process. Uh, I think what's hard to comprehend is the magnitude of the change which is coming forward and churning us, up, upheaving us in society right now. But so, you have trust in the process. I have absolute yeah. trust in the process. And yeah. that's, that's very important. That's also important to have trust in the process and trust in the inner healer when you conduct powerful inner journeys so you really can let go and surrender completely to whatever experiences Absolutely. might arise from inside. Yeah, to die when you're not sure what you're dying into, to die when you have no idea what, what's going to happen or whether any piece of your life will survive this transformation, to surrender completely and let the universe take you. Yeah. And, th and that is the kind of trust that you develop when you take many journeys. Because when you start taking not so many journeys, just wow, you have the first death experience. Are you going to survive this? But after we have several of them, then you can let go more and trust the process yeah. even more. Yeah. And um, In fact, you begin to realize that the greatest breakthroughs come after the deepest deaths. Exactly. So the irony is you begin to seek out the and, deep death. 
and I think, I think this is important because I think I think it is important to have some kind of cartography, some kind of map before you are entering these sessions, so you better can navigate in them. We found, for, for, for example, people coming here that that knowing that that you can have hard experience and it is common to have hard experience and know that these can be extremely cleansing. That's that's a really important message to have before you undertake the journey. Yes, very much so. A hard journey, a hard session is a good session. A hard session is a good, absolutely. Yeah. Um, back back to the the the, the um, archetypal astrology. What was totally mind blowing for me was when I read an, an article of of uh, Tarnasi in springtime and saw how co- connected the manifestation of our place here was with the collective transits. For example, the, the, the building of the place was exactly in the period from 2007 to 2020, where we had this Uranus-Pluto uh, square. And the, yeah. the, the, and, the, and the main building was born in 2009, where there was this Neptune-Jupiter conjunction. And just to, to see yeah. the, these connections was just like, it just blew my mind totally. And I just felt yeah. so so connected, you know, with, with, with the guy in mind. And, 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 and when, when you see your life and, and the way it is unfolding in connection to the college, to trends, and it just fit together, it just gives so much trust to the universe. It gives this this yeah. hope, and I think this this hope is important to bring forward to, to the new generations. Yes, yeah, very much so, very much. When you experience that deep resonance between your life and the life of the universe, the, your species life, once you experience that resonance and you know it is the underlying reality, then any time in your life when you're not ex- sinking into that resonance when you're not feeling anything the adjustment has to be made because you know that that resonance is always there it's just a matter of tapping into it and holding it and i think this is the main issue that is many people feel separated and feel feel like like they're separated from from the totality and this is what these powerful psychedelic experience can give that they can give this one one experience and give that actually we are all connected we are connected with the environment and and the stars and and suddenly we are connected to the whole cosmos and 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 this is this is i think this is some of the most important experiences that that you can have and and um, there's a big difference between reading about them and then having them the direct experience. Yeah. So, Chris, if you should, um, you know, are sending these questions out, if if you should give something, what 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 do you think about? Well, what can we do best to 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 support um, the new generation on their adventure of self discovery? Do you have any suggestions mm. to that? Can you can you comment on that? Well, <clears throat> yes. Just feel totally uh, free. Yeah. Personally, my first piece of advice coming out of my own personal experience is don't do what I did. (laughs) I worked exclusively at high dose levels of LSD. I pushed the envelope very, very hard. Uh, You know, I learned over time that I pushed it probably harder than was wise, harder than was good for me. Uh, that's the last chapter of this book is called Coming Off the Mountain. And uh, it was only after I stopped my sessions and began the process of coming off the mountain that I began to realize the full implications of just how far I had pushed myself into the universe. Uh, And if I were doing it over again, I would recommend a much slower approach i would recommend balancing high doses of a psychedelic with lower doses i would balance lsd or psychedelics which tend to push the cosmological ceiling like lsd or 5-meo dmt with psilocybin and ayahuasca which tend to be much more embodied grounded experiences or san pedro uh it's it's just a balanced I, th- I think now that we know that we can blow open the levels of, of mind, we can blow open the levels of consciousness, we can breathe deeply from the universe, then the question becomes, how, what does wisdom look like there? What is the wise balance between transcendence 
and eminence. When is the good time to open? When is the good time to stay closed? But particularly, how do we integrate? How do we absorb? How do we uh, take the experiences that we've had and nurture them into a, a transformed life? Uh, and I think it's one of the shadows of uh, any psychedelic movement is that if we don't, if we under integrate, we rush back to have more experiences again and again. When if we really integrate those experiences, we move more slowly, but we move more certainly as we go forward. So I would recommend uh, a very careful attention to balance between high and low doses, what substances you're using, between uh, psychedelic practice and contemplative practice, between a psychedelic practice and your social practice, because, you know, we need to be able to ground our experiences in our work in the world. My work was as a teacher. So I wrote The Living Classroom to sort of explain some of the impact of these psychedelic experiences in my work as a teacher. Other people are therapists or healers or musicians or creators in different art forms. There's a back and forth process, but all these things are relevant as we go forward. Uh, I think in some ways, moderation. Uh, I think we saw in the 60s in some ways what happens if we lose moderation, if we lose the groundedness to really have powerful psychedelic experience. It's not just a matter of having a powerful experience. Can we hold on to it? Can we ground it? Can we integrate it? Uh, these things change our body. They change our cellular functioning. They change our emotional structures. They change our porosity between us and other beings. Uh, so there's a lot to navigate as we go deeper into this territory. When I came back, when I left my sessions, when I stopped my work, within several years, I found myself entering a very deep sadness, what I call the deep sadness, which I had gone so deeply into transcendence that I found that eventually I was just waiting to die. I was waiting to go back. And that's not a good way to live your life. And it took me years to get to a point where I, I dealt with that and began to focus more on uh, drawing in more and more of that uh, transcendent energy into my daily life. I think this is very important messages that, that, you, that you get out here, uh, Chris. I think you were writing that it took you like 10 years before you really felt that you were balance in your energy system is is that is yeah that it took me about 10 years 10, 10, to really yeah. find my new common denominator yeah. so so you you recommend that that travelers now they are more gentle to themselves and then, then and they uh, make more out of integrate them and implement them into their daily life is that correct I do. I think so. I mean, basically, now that we know that we can blow the lid off consciousness, we have any number of different ways of opening up consciousness, then the question is skillful means, you know, and skillful means is balancing opening up, but then drawing in, holding on to uh, acting on the insights we were given making sure we have exhausted all the insights we yeah. were given before we yeah. go out into a new territory. Yes. Yeah. I, I just told Jorge before that that, uh, that that my way of integrating my experiences and handle these hundreds of, of high doses sessions that I've had, that has been to build this place and express them through creativity so that the energy all the time is you know flowing and is, is being expressed in art and writings and music and building and sculptures and, and um, in that way the, so the archetypal energy can, can can flow through the system and i think this is really yeah. important that the energy is, is flowing and is being expressed in in in, in your physical reality in your physical world and in your daily life yeah yeah and if for part of your experience the way you give expression to your experiences is through music and through community The way I gave expression to my experiences is through writing yes. uh, and through teaching. Yeah. So everybody has different genres. Uh, Martina Hoffman does hers through art. 
you know, um, Alex Gray through art and community. We all have different yes. kind of projects that we're here to work on. Playing different roles in the divine play. <laughs> yes. Sure. This was, I, I must say, this was one of the unexpected aspects of my work because I had entered this through kind of a Grofian paradigm of personal transformation, and I thought it was about personal transformation. And then when I opened up into the ocean of suffering and I learned that this work is not just about personal transformation, but the work itself is about collective transformation. Uh, that became part of the work. Uh, and then I began to receive, over many, many years, a series of visions about where humanity is and where humanity was going. And the visions are basically all consistent, even though they were given over a long period of time. They were consistent. They were basically saying that the human family was on the eve of a major transformation a transformation that would change the course of history. Uh, we were in the process of uh, basically the soul was waking up in history, that the soul is coming forward. Our deep consciousness is beginning to emerge within our individual consciousness. I began to have visions over and over again that we were poised on the brink of a tremendous, of a new sunrise, that, that the future the past would become irrelevant quickly into the future, that we were basically making a transition from one platform to another platform. Uh, and in an evolutionary sense, that there was a different human that was emerging and coming forward. Uh, I began to have experiences of this future human, of this transformed archetype of humanity that's, that's beginning to emerge. But nowhere in my sessions was it explained how this was going to take place. How would this new future human emerge? How would this actualization of higher state of consciousness emerge at a global level? And then in 1995, I had the, the session 55 took me into what I call the great awakening. It took me deep into the future And I was not a human, an individual human being at that point when I experienced this. I, I had dissolved completely into the species mind. So I dissolved into the species and then asked the human species, I went into the future and experienced the death and rebirth of humanity. Uh, I experienced that we were coming into a, a meltdown, that we were coming to a point where we we're losing control that we were not going to be able to control the conditions of our life. It was a tremendous fear and anxiety, uh, many deaths. Uh, and for a while, it was so bad, it looked like we would all be dead, that it really was an extinction event that we were coming through. But in the end, just when it was at its worst, the peak of the storm passed and there were survivors, many survived. And when we began to pick ourselves up and began to rebuild culture, we found that we were changed. Yeah. We had been changed by this crisis. Our heart was open in a way that it had not been open. Our mind was open. The depth of communion with the universe was deeper than it had been before. And in particular, our sense of self was different. We were not as tied to our individual egoic private mind, but literally the soul had entered the psyche that we were now more comfortable with the knowing that we are souls. We could feel the age within the being that we were. And a community of souls builds a different planet than a community of egos. And the work after transformation is the remaking of the body politic, the social and industrial and economic and educational matrix. So how operating out of a deeper transformative basis. 
So how are these experiences seen in the light what is going on now? I remember that Rick Tynas was talking about that what we experience on a collective level now is a kind of collective ego death experience. I think so. I think we are. Uh, we are beginning. It is as if we have entered the birth canal of history. Yeah. We have we have entered a critical time where we, if we continue to run the planet on the basis of the level of consciousness that we are in egoic consciousness, we're probably going to go extinct because egoic consciousness is always an us then. We we can take care of ourselves without taking care of others. And we have so much power and so many weapons that if we continue in this way, we're probably going to go extinct. Uh, and yeah, I think we are in the process of waking up. We're in the process of really recognizing that that's where we've been heading leads just to perpetual frustration. It's just a perpetual frustration. We either wake up or we die. We either grow up or we die. And I think we're in the process. I think we will make it. I think we will grow up. I'm very happy to hear that. I think that too. <laughs> so if, do you, can you can you give some, if you should give the, the younger generation some advices how to, to, to wake up now and how to deal with the situation and what, what they can do to heal the species mind and, and heal the collective wounds, what, what would you then say? Hmm. Well, first, I think these new generations that are coming in are a very interesting generation. They're a very mature generation. Uh, they are, it's kind of like uh, the universe has sent in the 18 as we go into crisis. It's really sending in mature souls to help us move through this crisis. And so I find that young people are coming in very wired, very differently than older generations. They are much more actively engaged in it. Uh, my advice would be first, uh, go slow. When, now that we have the technology, now that we have all these means of opening up consciousness, uh, the second step is to learn how to do so wisely. There's unwise opening and wise opening. Uh, there's ways of doing it safely and ways of doing it not safely. And part of that involves if we're going to enter temporary states of consciousness in which we are more sensitive, more open, more aware, we should balance those with a daily spiritual practice because a daily spiritual practice is really critical to absorb the energy that runs through us in a session day and to absorb the insights Um, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, and then uh, we have to change the circumstance, we have to change our life so that our life be begins to reflect the values that we experience in our sessions. If we don't, if we experience great truth and great insights into reality, but we don't live those insights in our daily life, We, we create a tension, we create a schizophrenia within our life. So making your daily life coherent with and in alignment with your insights from your psychedelic sessions, uh, you know, that's really, really important, I think. So go slow, integrate well. And what, and what, thank you, and what, what, what role do you think that psychedelics has in this very urgent time we're living in? Uh, Well, <clears throat> with the nuclear bomb, history changed, right? Yeah. Because with the nuclear bomb, conventional war became increasingly impossible to use because if we use these weapons, we'll extinguish life on this planet. Mm -hmm. So with the invention of the nuclear bomb, history began to pivot. Likewise, LSD and the psychedelic movement coming into existence at the same time in Western consciousness, of course, Ancient cultures have been working with psychedelics for millennia. Yeah. But in our culture, this, this technology that allows us to experience a deeper and wider consciousness. Um, hmm, I'm losing track a little bit of the question that you But asked. I'm, I'm talking about, many are talking about the psychedelic renaissance. 
what role yeah. do you think the psychedelics are playing in uh, our time right now? Because many are talking about this renaissance of psychedelics, yeah. and many people are searching for alternative yeah. ways to get healing because they can see that this that yeah. way, that don't, doesn't work for them. I think that basically psychedelics give us more insight and they give us a deeper healing modality because this flushing of collective pain up through the individual psyche is happening to all of us. It's not just happening when we do a psychedelic session, but the, it is as if the collective psyche is trying to heal itself. It's, it's pouring these things out of us. And when we work with psychedelics, we open not only to our personal pain, but we open to this collective pain. So psychedelics can become a very important vehicle to consciously participate in a collective transformational process. One of, one of my uh, favorite little stories is about, I think you have seen it, where, where Jung, as an 80 years old man, is interviewed in BBC, and the interviewers ask him if, if he believes in God. I think you have mm-hmm. seen it, and there's this big smile yeah. on his face, and he say, no. I know, yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. think this is this is really important because that is what happened in the Illusionian Mysteries, where Socrates yeah. and Plato initiated. They had a direct experiences of the beyond. Yeah. So, so and that's and, really important today because our intellectual environment, our scientific environment, and and the academic environment teaches that the world is unconscious, that there is no consciousness in the universe, that we're all basically just physical beings produced by accident. It's a terribly destructive mindset, and psychedelics shatter that mindset. You know, it gives us a much deeper understanding of the universe. And we need that spiritual understanding. Uh, and it gives us an understanding of the universe, I think, which is deeper than all the religions which have been on the surface of the planet up until this point in time. It, it, it both affirms them, and yet it also takes us deeper underneath those religions into the reality that they're describing. So, so, so you think that psychedelic has an important role to play in this precious time here? I think I think they're absolutely essential. It's not an accident that such a powerful, yeah. healing, evocative, uncovering series of chemicals entered into Western consciousness at precisely that generation, which was having to deal with the nuclear threat having to deal with the ecological threat, which is having to deal with the shrinking of the world through technology. And now we have this chemical which opens us to a deeper underlying uh, matrix of cause and effect operating. So it's like the perfect medicine for both insight and healing that we need at this point in time. As as Stan calls it, the medicine of the medicine par excellence. (laughs) Yes, I think so, Um, yeah. Chris, it is so wonderful to talk to you. It's so wonderful to have a dialogue. I appreciate your work and you so very much. I think it's groundbreaking work that you have been doing. We are getting to the to the end of this dialogue. Do you have a, a final word that you would like to to share with us? Some final thoughts and yeah. Well, first, thank you very much, Jacob, for the invitation to be here. It's been a pleasure to to speak with you and with all of your audience. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, I uh, yeah, I would. This is a time when I think everybody who's here is a volunteer. Everybody knew what we were getting into when we incarnated. Uh, therefore, we don't need to look outside ourselves. We need to look deep within ourselves to find what is our particular part to play in this larger transformational process. Uh, My advice would be go slow, uh, go deep, you know, let it take time to absorb everything that we take in and not to waste any of these precious experiences and then be bold. This is a time for action to be bold. Uh, to cultivate the one heart that holds all existence, including all non-human existence in the world, to cultivate and to hold that and to find a way of actualizing it. Wise words. Thank you so much, Chris.
Please give me a big you. hand. Thank That's you so love. much for participating in this tribute, Stan. <laughs> love you and really honor you and just appreciate Thank all your work. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. Nice. Thank you. Take care. Have a wonderful weekend. Yeah. You too. Thank you. Much love. Bye. Much love Bye. to you too. Yeah. Yes, dear everyone. You good. Let me tell you again. Sorry. Dear everyone, now it's time to eat in the best picnic manner. And as mentioned, you are welcome to place yourself wherever you want here in the garden. We meet here at the stage again at 6 p.m. where we must tradition tour hold our drumming ceremony. If you have brought drums and rattles, then do bring them down here at the stage. Have a lovely break. <laughs>